Hi, good morning to one and all. I am K. V. Harish, Assistant Professor, Department of Civil Engineering, IIT Kanpur. You are watching MOOC lecture course on hydration, porosity and strength of cementitious material. Uh, today we will see uh, lectures 28 to 30. Remember that uh, in this, in these lectures, three lectures are together combined, 28, 29 and 30 together. And uh, the main topic is mineral admixtures and in the previous uh, topics uh, we have extensively seen uh, production and properties of fly ash and how uh, the properties of fly ash actually influ influence the properties of uh, Portland cement based space systems. Um, in this lecture we will see uh, largely about uh, silica fume and uh, slag and uh, we will uh, initially go ahead with silica fume and see uh, similar to uh, fly ash how uh, each of uh, those properties uh, get affected because of the addition of silica fume. And then we will go on to uh, slag and then compare the performance of all the different pozolons uh, with respect to control uh, mixtures. Now uh, uh, for these lecture the textbooks or reference materials are shown. So uh, the overview of the lecture is as follows, this lecture provides detailed information about mineral admixtures such as uh, silica fume and slag. In addition, the, their physical properties and chemical composition are discussed. In the previous lectures, we have seen fly ash extensively, uh, primarily the physical properties, chemical composition. Uh, in addition to how they influence properties of Portland cement, uh, Portland cement based space systems. And uh, in this one, we will see uh, the chemical uh, properties and physical properties of uh, silica fume and slag and the effect of these pozolons on properties of uh, Portland cement based space systems is also discussed. So um, under silica fume, what we will see is uh, what is the appropriate uh, definition of silica um, how silica fume is produced and uh, what are the properties of silica fume and uh, what are the applications of silica fume and uh, any limitations with the uh, pozzolone. Uh, likewise, we will uh, see similar top uh, topics for slag also. So, we will now start with uh, silica fume. So, um, production of silica fume, uh, first of all a definition what is meant by silica fume. Silica fume is a byproduct of the smelting process in the production of silicon metal and uh, ferrosilicon alloys uh, that contains more than 75 percentage silicon. So, by definition uh, silica fume is a byproduct uh, in the production process of uh, silicon metal and ferrosilicon alloys. Now, uh, if you get into the production of silica fume, basically you have uh, two different process, one is the smelting process, the other one is a dust extraction and what usually happens is that uh, this melting process involves heating to 1800 degrees Celsius and uh, basically the silicon and the carbide that is present uh, in, the, in the metal, uh, in the metal ores, they basically get heated and uh, SiO plus O2 gives 4 SiO2 which is silicon dioxide and uh, the, the silica fume which is actually fine particles, um, they are actually captured in filter bags be, uh, before they uh, get off to the exhaust and uh, those particles which actually fall down which is actually called as the micro silica, they are called uh, as silica fume. So, many times silica fume is also known as micro silica. Okay? So, typically uh, the size range of uh, silica fume is extremely smaller. So, we will again uh, uh, when we go to physical properties, we will see what is the fineness and particle size and other information. So, um, what you get out of the smelting process is primarily the silicon metals because the ores. Uh, uh, which contains impurities, uh, primarily the carbide, they, gets, uh, they get removed and uh, the setup shown here involves uh, some electrode and furnace and other such arrangements uh, used in the production of silicon metal. 
Now, uh, more information about uh, what are the raw materials that are used in the silica, uh, silica film production and others. Raw materials such as uh, carbon and quartz uh, are used and the primary source of carbon is coke, coal or wood chips and primarily they are subjected to very high temperatures. Uh, the smelting furnace usually it ranges from uh, 1800 degrees Celsius to about 2000 degrees Celsius. So, sometimes uh, the furnace temperature uh, is not uh, the temperature used in the smelting process is not uh, very precise in some cases they use 1800 in some cases they use uh, 2000, but uh, it is much higher than uh, the uh, conventional temperatures that are used in the coal production process or others. And in, in the process as we have already seen you have a filter uh, bags that is uh, one the other one is the silicon metal which is extracted and remember that silicon metal is actually the main element which actually comes out and silica fume is actually a byproduct from the silicon met metal extraction. So, finally, what you have is a silica fume and uh, the reactions uh, which we have seen previously is again once again shown for um, easy understanding. Basically, this, the silica SiO2 reacts with uh, carbon to form pure silica and uh, the carbon monoxide that forms uh, uh, gets out uh, into the atmosphere. Now, very many information about the production of silica fume is not uh, required for this course because what is more important for this course is uh, primarily the physical and chemical properties of uh, this material and how it influences the properties of Portland cement based paste system. So, production uh, primarily is important only from the standpoint of uh, what are the temperatures that are used and what types of reaction takes place and what are the raw materials used and uh, such uh, things. Now, uh, having seen the uh, production of silica fume, uh, we should also know that the chemical composition of silica fume is uh, highly influenced by uh, several factors. Number one, the raw materials that you use and hence their composition also. Like for example, you use quartz, you use coal which is uh, source of carbon and hence their composition also has immense effect on the composition of silica fume. In addition to that, the type and amount of alloys that are used also has substantial effect on the chemical composition of silica fume. We will see the chemical composition little later. Um, but uh, these are important factors uh, from the production plant which can actually influence the properties of silica fume. Now, uh, typically, uh, typically silica fume used in uh, cement or uh, concrete applications ranges between 85 percentage to 98 percentage silica. So, now uh, we will go to the typical oxide composition of uh, silica fume and uh, what is shown in this uh, table is that here you have component where the oxides are listed and at the bottom you have some information about chloride, uh, moisture content and others. And uh, here what is presented is the percentage of oxides and what we find is that the silicon dioxide is uh, typically uh, 96 percentage uh, uh, whatever is shown in this uh, figure. But remember that uh, silica fume could actually range from 85 percentage to 98 percentage depending upon all these factors. Okay? So, one should not directly uh, take 96 percentage as a very stiff value to understand the percentage of silica fume that uh, silica that is present in silica fume. So, um, and if you take uh, the remaining uh, oxides, if you take carbon or iron, alumina or magnesium, all other oxides are typically present in very low amounts. And remember that this carbon is a very important factor. For this particular case alone, what we can see is since the silicon content is extremely high, the carbon content is uh, lower. Uh, but um, if uh, the production process does not uh, have a refined system um, in the capturing process of uh, silica fume, what tends to happen is uh, carbon in the raw material uh, will stay in the silica fume. So, in such cases the carbon content will be much higher 
and in for the same cases the silicon dioxide co content will, will be much lower. So, um, so that is where the importance of this range comes into picture. Now, um, all other oxides in any cases uh, are usually uh, at very low amount. So, they are uh, not a very uh, big factor in it. Um, so, primarily the two things that comes into picture is uh, silicon dioxide and carbon. Now, uh, when it comes to chemical uh, requirements as uh, already mentioned in uh, the, the couple of lectures before, um, for a pozzolanic materials like silica fume, we have IS 15388, uh, which primarily uh, gives more information about the chemical requirements. So, what is specified in the code is actually uh, shown here. Um, so, if you take uh, silicon dioxide content, um, so, if we want to use silica fume from a particular source, we have to make sure that the minimum amount of silicon dioxide should be 85 percentage. If, if you have much lower than that, it actually does not qualify to serve as a pozzolan in cement based space systems. So, what IS uh, has specified is that the minimum quantity to, uh, should be 85 percentage and um, other specifications are also given. and. Uh, the probably the other most important uh, things or the loss on ignition uh, which which is uh, 4 percentage maximum and alkalis which is 1.5 percentage maximum. So, these are other important uh, things sometimes these limits could be substantially higher and uh, remember that loss on ignition is a function of the carbon content. Higher the loss on ignition usually indicates the higher um, indicates that the carbon content in the pozzolan is higher. So, uh, uh, IS has safely mentioned a maximum limit of 4 percentage for loss on ignition. Likewise, if uh, alkalis are actually present in excess amount, that is also a problem primarily from the standpoint of alkali silica reaction because in alkali silica reaction distress. Uh, uh, the internal sources of alkali can uh, cause uh, ca uh, can react with uh, the reactive um, aggregates present in the Portland cement based space systems and they can form alkali silica reaction gel which will eventually leads to uh, lead to uh, cracking of the system. So, from an alkali silica reaction standpoint it should be restricted uh, it should be ma made sure that the alkalis are restricted to 1.5 percentage. But remember that alkali silica pro problem, alkali silica reaction problem will exist only if the aggregates are reactive in nature. If the aggregates are non-reactive in nature, um, uh, still uh, um, if, the no, if the aggregates are non-reactive in nature, then the issue of alkali silica reaction does not come into picture. In that case, even higher amounts of alkalis is uh, fine with the system. Now, uh, coming to the chemical composition of silica fume and comparing it with uh, other uh, uh, mixtures and primarily uh, what we are doing is comparing uh, we are comparing with uh, cement. Uh, so, what we find is that the silicon dioxide typically is 80, 85 to 98 percentage and it is substantially higher compared to cement. While the cement uh, has higher calcium oxide uh, content, the calcium oxide content typically in uh, silica fume is uh, either 0 or it is very little quantity. And uh, these uh, the silicon dioxide and calcium oxide are primarily the uh, oxides which uh, which are actually comparable with uh, cement. All other things uh, there are not much uh, limits that are provided and uh, um, it could actually vary uh, depending upon uh, the production process and several others. And not only that all the other oxides are also less in quantity compared to silica and calcium, calcium oxide. Now, coming to uh, the physical properties of silica fume, uh, some of them are discussed. Uh, one uh, is morphology. So, silica fume particles appear to be agglomerated or condensed or uh, densified. That means, um, silica fume particles are not uh, present as uh, individual particles. They basically uh, stick, uh, stick with each other and they are generally found in the densified uh, or condensed form. Um, this uh, uh, primarily happens because uh, if there are some moisture that is present in the atmosphere, they tend to, um, they tend to uh, 
have uh, they tend to attract the moisture and uh, and all the uh, silica film particles generally agglomerate uh, with each other. Now, um, the second one is shape the silica film particles are generally found to be spherical in shape. Remember that uh, we have also seen fly ash which are actually spherical in shape. So, like fly ash uh, we cannot also see the spherical shape of silica film in our naked eye primarily because the silica film particles are very fine in um, very uh, have very high fineness or the particle size is too small uh, to see in the naked eye. So, um, the shape uh, of silica film particle is spherical like um, like uh, fly ash. However, uh, if you take cement, uh, the particles are angular in shape. So, uh, if you compare uh, the shapes of different materials that we use in Portland cement based base systems, you find that some may be angular, some may be spherical, some may be uh, some may be uh, some other shape. So, uh, but the shape can actually substantially uh, affect the properties or it can also uh, improve the properties. Okay. So, let us see how uh, uh, whether shape is an important factor for silica film or not in affecting other properties. Now, if you go to the size of uh, silica film particle, uh, the mean particle diameter D50 is approximately in the range of 0 0.02 to 0.25 micron meter. So, this uh, if you can imagine this is something like 100 times smaller than the average uh, cement particle. So, if you uh, get back to the fly ash lectures that we saw in the previous uh, 3 to 4 lectures, what we will find is that uh, the particle size distribution of cement is similar to the particle size distribution of fly ash uh, and many times the fly ash can have uh, particle size between 12 to 45 micron. Uh, when I say uh, particle size, I am talking about D50. So, it can be between 10 to 45 and many times uh, it can also be lower than 10 micron. Typically, uh, the average particle size of cement is in the range of 10 to 30 or 40 micron meter. So, fly ash and uh, cement has similar particle size distribution, but when it comes to silica fume, the silica fume particles are 100 times smaller than um, that of uh, the cement particles and uh, what is specified here is the range is uh, 0 0.02 to 0.25 micron. So, uh, that that is a very very small uh, uh, size in terms of uh, uh, when it comes to uh, using it as a pozzolan in um, Portland cement based base systems. The morphology of silica film particle uh, as I already mentioned the shape cannot be seen through naked eye. So, a scanning electron microscope image is shown where you can see that at a 500 uh, nanometer uh, level uh, we can see that uh, the shape of the silica film particles are spherical and remember that this is 500 nanometer, nanometer is 10 power minus 9 meters. Okay. And uh, what we also see is that the agglomeration that is few particles together join uh, I mean uh, particles together join with each other and they are generally seen as agglomerated or condensed or densified form. So, that is what is uh, can be uh, observed from this figure. Now, if we want to have a comparative image of say cement and silica film particle along with fly ash. Uh, remember that uh, slag is also included here, but we will see slag a little later. So, if you want to compare all these materials together at the uh, microstructure level and remember that we are talking only about the uh, dry powders. So, in the case of cement you find that the particle size are typically angular in nature. So, we cannot uh, simply assume cement particles to be spherical in shape, it is uh, it's not appropriate. So, at the micro level it is purely angular in shape um, and in the case of fly ash you find that uh, it is uh, more, more or less spherical in shape and of course, you have again cenospheres, pleurospheres and several things and again cenospheres you do not have anything um, inside it whereas, pleurospheres you have multiple balls inside this. So, largely fly ash contains more amounts of pleurospheres compared to cenospheres. So, these are some of the 
uh, images, typical images that uh, we see for fly ash. And uh, if you have a look at silica fume, you are not even able to see the particular size or shape of silica fume. Remember that all these figures are taken at same magnification. So, if you carefully look into the figure, there is a, a magnification level that is indicated. In all these figures, the magnification level is 10 micron meter. So, if you typically look at a 10 micron meter, you will be able to appreciate the shape of fly ash, appreciate the shape of cement and appreciate the shape of slag, whereas at 10 micron level, the silica fume particles cannot be uh, visualized, cannot be even seen, cannot be observed because the particles are 1 by 100th of the size of the cement particles as we just saw a couple of slides before. So, um, remember that the slide that we discussed uh, in the previous slide, this is at a 500 nanometer which is much, much higher magnification compared to this 10 micron meter. So, at the same level, we cannot uh, see what is the shape of silica fume and still higher magnifications are required to understand that it is also spherical in shape. Now, uh, other information about slag, even though we are not dealing slag right now, we will deal a little later. Uh, but uh, slag is generally uh, angular in shape similar to cement and uh, usually uh, slag is available as a, the particle size distribution of slag is much, much higher than uh, cement and fly ash and silica fume and hence many times grinding process is used in order to make the slag finer. Okay? So, we will again uh, discuss about all these things when we come to slag. As of now, um, what we can see is that at a comparative magnification of say about 10 micron, the silica fume particles are typically not visible. All that you can see is only small, small clusters of silica fume particles um, densified together. Now, uh, other physical properties uh, may include bulk density, color and uh, when it comes to color, you have to understand that the color could be between white to gray. Either it could be white also, it could also be gray depending upon the percentage of iron and carbon present in the silica fume. If carbon is present in very low quantities, then the silica fume will appear to be white. Usually the iron content is very less in silica fume unlike in Portland, Portland cement. Um, and uh, the third one is specific gravity and the specific gravity of silica fume is approximately 2.202 and um, usually um, the specific gravity does not change very much like uh, what we have seen with fly ash because with fly ash we typically uh, uh, the specific gravity ranges from 2 to 2.8. We do not find uh, that much variation primarily because uh, uh, the oxide composition of uh, silica fume largely contains silicon dioxide and you do not have uh, much uh, oxide, uh, much other oxides. And uh, with respect to specific surface area, uh, typically it is found to be in the range of 15,000 to 20,000 meter square per kg. Um, so, this is a very important value. Now, uh, we will get into some of the physical properties in detail. Now, bulk density. Now, there are silica fume may be available in four different forms. One is undensified form, the other one is densified form, the other one is pelletized form, the other one is uh, slurry form. So, there are four forms of uh, silica fume which we generally find uh, from the uh, power plant. Uh, one undensified silica fume is when all the particles are completely separated and they are not agglomerated like this. So, a photograph of the undensified silica fume is shown and densified silica fume is shown where you can clearly observe that small, small particles are um, combined together in the condensed form. And uh, for better reactivity, we always prefer silica fume to be in the undensified form. But uh, when uh, you have silica fume in the undensified form and if it is exposed to atmosphere, slowly it also comes to the densified form. So, we have to be careful, a little more careful in storing silica fume. Now, the third one is actually pelletized form in which uh, we can uh, add a little bit of water and make it into uh, uh, bigger uh, uh, globules um, and uh, those globules are generally referred as pellets. 
So, uh, you can we can have uh, such type of uh, silica film also um, and uh, they can be also used if it is properly produced they can be also used as a um, fine aggregate replacement or uh, coarse aggregate replacement material. Now, in addition to these three, we can also add a substantial quantity of water and make it into a slurry form and uh, remember that in all the four forms, the bulk density changes because the topic is primarily bulk density and we have to know uh, that the bulk density changes depending upon the different forms of silica film. In the case of undensified silica film, approximately it is 350 kg per meter cube. In the case of densified uh, silica film, it ranges from 480 to 720 kg per meter cube. In the case of pelletized uh, silica film, it is approximately 1000 kg per meter cube and when it is in the slurry form, it is 1300 to 1400 kg per meter cube. So, these are some of the ranges that you may have to remember um, if something is asked in the assignment or, uh, or examination. And uh, of the four forms, usually uh, silica film to be in the densified form, which is uh, for which the bulk density typically varies from 480 to 720 kg per meter cube. Now, coming to the second one color as already mentioned, uh, the color could be either white or gray in color or dark gray in color. Largely, we find that uh, silica film is uh, dark gray in color and that is primarily because of carbon or iron content. Now, uh, if we get back to what are the physical requirements because uh, right now we have seen some of the physical properties and if we go to the Indian standard codes to check what are the physical properties that are specified, um, some are uh, shown here where the specific surface area which is given in meter square per gram is approximately 15 and uh, remember that this is a minimum value. And this is uh, expressed in meter square per gram. Okay, it has to be 15 meter square per gram uh, at a minimum for any uh, silica fume to be used in Portland cement based base system. But if you want to express fineness or particle size in terms of amount passing through 45 micron sieve, like what how like how we saw for uh, the fly ash particles that limit is also uh, given here. So, if you take the oversize percent retained on 45 micron ISCF is only 10 percentage. The, the other way of understanding is that at least um, 90 percentage should have actually passed through 45 micron C. So, that is a requirement by the Indian standards and this is maximum. So, maximum 10 percentage should be retained which means 0 to 10 percentage could be retained but anything about that should not be retained which means 90 percentage or lower should have been passed through this 45 micron sieve. Likewise, if you actually see the compressive strength when you use silica fume in mixtures and you compare it with a reference mixture which do not have silica fume, um, the what is specified in the code is that at least 85 percentage of the strength should be uh, uh, 85 percentage of the control strength should be attained by the uh, mixture containing silica fume. So, and uh, this is uh, said at a uh, 7 day uh, curing period. Okay. So, these are 3 important requirements uh, for uh, the silica fume before it is used for any construction or cement based applications. And uh, some of the uh, comparative uh, physical properties of silica fume with other particles are also shown. So, here what you find is you have the different materials, Portland's, uh, uh, Portland cement, natural pozzolans, fly ash, silica fume, rice's cash, calcine clay. Uh, now, uh, right now let us not compare all the things, but right now just compare only Portland cement, fly ash and silica fume because we have extensively gone through uh, these three materials. Now, if you take the mean size for Portland cement, it is typically between 10 to 15. For fly ash, which is usually in the same particle size range of uh, cement, that is also found to be 10 to 15. If you take silica fume, it is 0.1 to 0.3. Okay, that is a very important value and all these things are expressed in 
uh, micron meters. So, the mean size for silica fume is substantially lower compared to other pozolons. Likewise, if you take surface area, in the case of Portland cement, it is lower than 1 meter square per gram. In the case of fly ash, it is, it is somewhere between 1 to 2 meter square per gram. In the case of silica fume, it is 15 to 25 meter square per gram. So, this also indicates that silica fume particle is much, much smaller in shape, uh, smaller in size. And uh, the particle shape is also uh, provided. In the case of Portland cement, it is angular and irregular. In the case of fly ash, it is mostly spherical. In the case of silica fume, it is also spherical. Other uh, pro pro the properties provided for other pozolons or just for information and you can always uh, compare it with uh, silica fume or other materials. And uh, in the case of specific gravity, approximately for Portland cement it is 3.2, for fly ash it ranges from 2.2 to 2.4, for silica fume it ranges, uh, it is uh, generally 2.2. Uh, now, what does silica fume particles uh, do in Portland cement based space systems? Uh, we know that uh, silica fume particles or small spherical uh, particles of amorphous silica and primarily uh, if you actually recall uh, some 3, 4 lectures before when we are discussing about the reactive components that are present in pozolons, we find that a substantial higher amounts of amorphous silica is present in silica fume. So, the silica content that we have seen uh, ranging between 85 percentage to 98 percentage does not indicate necessarily that all the uh, silica that is present or reactive, but we can generally understand that uh, more than 50 to 60 percentage will be usually reactive or in other words 50 to 60 percentage will be at, at a minimum will be amorphous silica. So, though, though amorphous silica are nothing but those forms or, of silica which are uh, ready to react immediately and undergo pozolonic reaction. So, when you have silica fume in the Portland cement based space systems and that too has very small spherical particles, they are uh, generally ready to react immediately. So, um, there are two types of effects that you uh, tend to find whenever you use silica fume in concrete. One is uh, void filling effect or in other words explained as filling in voids, which means if you find uh, any voids in Portland cement based space systems. Like for example, we have already seen uh, in lectures uh, between uh, L11 and L20 that Portland cement based space system contains uh, capillary voids, uh, the capillary pores, gel pores and many others. So, those are uh, basically pores and if silica fume particles are very finer, they are effectively capable of getting into those pores and uh, trying to fill and reduce the pore size much, much lower. So, one effect that you find is the void filling effect. The other effect that you find is the pozolonic effect in the sense that they basically react with uh, the calcium hydroxide that is produced from cement hydration even at the early ages and uh, um, the forms uh, calcium silicate hydrate gel having much, much lower um, calcium to silicate ratio compared to the primary silicate hydrate, uh, hydrate gel, silicate hydrate gel that is produced from cement uh, hydration. So, there are two effects that comes into uh, picture. One is the void filling effect, the other one is the pozolonic effect. And in the void filling effect, again we have uh, densely packing the voids, the other one is when it packs the voids, some voids may actually contain water. So, they will also try to expel the water out. So, if we actually again get back to capillary pores and gel pores which are discussed uh, previously, you find that some quantity of water may be present in gel pores or capillary pores. So, when uh, you use silica fume, these ba basically occupy the voids uh, or pores and if water is present in the pores, they are expelled out. And uh, the dense packing results in l lower porosity or less porosity, this will result in improved durability. Likewise, the ex expelling of water uh, results in more water available for molding. Okay? So, that actually helps in molding purpose and that improves the plasticity of the mixture. This is, uh, this is one reason why many times silica fume is uh, used as a uh, potential admixture 
uh, when it comes to pumpability of concrete okay because pumpable concrete requires uh, mixture to be uh, cohesive and plastic so uh, silica fume helps in making the mixture uh, cohesive and plastic and it is not just for pumping applications alone um, even for uh, some applications like uh, tunnel grouting or uh, tunnel short creating uh, where we need to inject a huge amount of cementitious material at a very high velocities these uh, type of uh, silica fume uh, extensively helps in providing that cohesiveness and plasticity so this is about uh, void filling effect the next one is pozzolanic effect so when you have pozzolanic reaction and when you have the secondary calcium silicate hydrate gel that is being formed um, it basically depletes the calcium hydroxide and uh, that again leads to higher strength okay primarily because calcium silicate hydrate gel is the strength forming phase and you tend to produce more and more calcium silicate hydrate gel uh, with uh, the use of silica fume and that improves the strength now uh, coming on to the nature of uh, products from pozzolanic reaction the composition and nature of secondary uh, silicate hydrate gel formed due to pozzolanic reaction of silica fume particle is very different from the primary calcium silicate hydrate gel for, formed from the cement hydration process and in this case the secondary uh, calcium silicate hydrate gel has a lower c by s ratio that actually helps in improving the durability and strength of portland cement based paste systems U usage of silica fume silica fume is used in portland cement based applications uh, in two different ways as a partial replacement for cement by weight and as an additional constituent material to cement so um, this is uh, similar to what we have seen in uh, fly ash uh, which was dealt in the uh, previous lecture so you can use it also as a partial replacement or as a additional uh, element in uh, cement now uh, what are the usual effects uh, when we say effects effects not in terms of uh, properties in terms of properties we will see at a later stage uh, but uh, immediately when you add silica fume is there any effect uh, with respect to the reactivities of tricalcium aluminate or others so that is what is discussed here the effect of addition of silica fume in the mixture results in dilution effect on the C3A. So remember that C3A stands for tricalcium aluminate and uh, many times when you have silica fume mixture the uh, some elements of silica fume can actually react with uh, tricalcium aluminate ok. So, uh, so uh, this tries to dilute, uh, dilute the C3A primarily because um, it is expected that a certain amount of water has to react with C3A. When you have silica fume uh, in the in the mixture, silica fume basically, since it is in the very fine form, um, it will uh, get dissolved in water and it will dilute the effect of water, and hence it can affect the hydration of C3A. The second point is increase in uh, the content of the principal strength forming phase so as we have already seen that uh, you have more and more secondary calcium silicate hydrate gel formed uh, the net uh, effect will be that you will have very high amounts of calcium silicate hydrate gel in the system and the third effect is that um, there is a reduction in the pH of uh, concrete this is primarily because we have already seen that in pozzolanic reaction the calcium hydroxide gets converted to calcium silicate hydrate gel because of uh, the reaction with the pozzolan and remember that calcium hydroxide has a higher pH that is one of the advantages that we have because uh, uh, because we want uh, concrete to have a higher pH primarily from the standpoint of resisting corrosion. So when you use silica fume or for that matter any other pozzolan because of the reduction of uh, because of uh, the reduction in the quantities of calcium hydroxide the pH also reduces but remember that uh, pH still will be somewhere in the range of uh, 12 to 13 uh, it won't go below 12 but anything below 11 um, then the system is uh, uh, 
uh, very much vulnerable to corrosion. So, uh, uh, somewhere between 12 to 13 it is still ok, but however if calcium hydroxide is also present then typically the pH of concrete will range from 13 to 14. If it is not present and if you have pozolons then it will be in the range of 12 to 13. Now, um, uh, what is the dosage of silica, uh, silica fume that uh, is usually added? So, the recommended dosage typically varies from 4 to 12 percentage and remember that this is by weight of cement when you replace it by weight of cement and another information is that this is as per Indian standards. Okay? So, um, the Indian standards typically says that you can try between 4 to 12 percentage, but usually when it exceeds 12 percentage either the mixture becomes too costly for the simple reason that silica fume even though it is a industrial waste uh, material, um, it is a very costly product unlike fly ash. Fly ash is completely uh, zero cost. Whereas, in the case of silica fume, the cost of silica fume is approximately 2 to 3 times that of cement. So, uh, from the uh, standpoint of economy which we have uh, discussed uh, uh, some 4 or 5 lectures before, silica fume is usually not used as a replacement for uh, cement unless you need special properties from silica fume. So, uh, largely we prefer to use fly ash or slag which are uh, either less costly or completely no cost compared to silica fume. However, the recommended dosages is between 4 percentage to 12 percentage, but uh, the actual uh, dosage to be used for application depends upon uh, what is the special properties uh, required for that application. For example, if it is going to be pumpable, then again you may have to do some optimization studies within the uh, recommended dosage to find out which can actually suit the application. And uh, likewise, uh, if it is going to be for uh, say ultra high performance uh, concrete, which is actually a different uh, grade of concrete, uh, uh, which is getting popular during the last uh, 5 to 10 years, where uh, silica fume is used at the dosage of about uh, 15 to 25 percentage which is much higher than what is uh, recommended uh, uh, what is uh, recommended by standards. So, for the, such a special applications uh, we have to do optimization studies at different dosages and find out uh, which actually uh, suits which dosage actually suits that particular uh, application. Now, uh, most important uh, things, uh, what are the effects of silica fume on specific properties of Portland cement based paste system. So, some of the properties that we are going to uh, see are paste density, workability, bleeding potential, air entrainment, uh, setting time, heat of hydration, compressive strength, permeability, pore size distribution, alkali silica reaction and sulphate resistance. Remember that many of these properties have been already seen uh, for fly ash. So, now we are actually seeing similar properties for silica fume. Now, with regard to paste density, uh, the addition of silica fume increases the density of Portland cement based paste systems at very low replacement level. That very low replacement level is an extremely important terminology for the simple reason that the silica fume particles have a uh, lower specific gravity compared to cement uh, particles. So, what happens is the usual tendency is that when you use silica fume as a replacement for cement or as an additional material for cement. Uh, the uh, density of the paste density tends to reduce, but that is that usually happens only at higher dosage levels. At very low dosage levels what happens is the voids that are present in uh, cement grains or cement particles, they are being filled by silica fume particles as we have already seen in some few slides before. Uh, so, uh, so, there is a void filling effect. Uh, and there is also a specific gravity effect. Slight changes in density of Portland cement based paste systems are observed when the silica fume dosage is at recommended dosage which is between 4 percentage to 12 percentage. However, there is substantial changes in density um, if the silica fume is used at a higher uh, replacement levels. So, that um, at higher uh, replacement levels, the specific gravity effect uh, dominates all others and uh, you will find that the uh, silica fume mixtures have uh, lower density compared to the reference mixtures which do not contain silica fume. 
Now coming on to the next property which is workability. The workability decreases with the addition of silica fume in Portland cement waste space system primarily because of the very high surface area or fineness of silica fume particles. Remember that silica fume particles are spherical in shape. But Remember having been spherical in shape, it cannot increase the workability primarily because of the particle size. In the case of silica fume, the very fine particle size dominates when it comes to workability compared to the shape. The same is not true in the case of fly ash. What we have seen with fly ash is that fly ash particles are also spherical in shape, but their sizes are much much larger compared to the silica fume particle and their particle sizes are also comparable with uh, cement uh, particles and hence there the particle size uh, does not dominate. For fly ash particle size does not dominate, but particle shape dominates and it actually helps in providing uh, ball bearing effect and all others which we have already seen. So in the case of silica fume, um, the uh, specific surface area or fineness largely dominates and because of that the workability decreases. And uh, the other thing that is uh, very important is that there is no ball bearing effect which we can see with uh, fly ash particles. And how do you overcome the effect of decreased workability? Uh, very simple uh, thing is that we use high range water reducers. Okay, so uh, uh, remember that the use of chemical admixtures and silica fume both are actually costly. In the case of fly ash and slag, it's a cheaper material. So uh, usually, uh, with uh, with regard to application, silica fume or uh, material as a pozzolan is actually less preferred compared to fly ash or slag. Not only that, when you use uh, uh, silica fume, you also require high range water reducers, uh, which are also costlier. Now, the third property is bleeding potential, and what uh, what you can see is that bleeding potential reduces with the addition of silica fume which is actually a positive thing and uh, this is again uh, due to very high uh, specific surface area. So remember that uh, higher fineness of silica fume or very low particle size of fly ash helps in reducing the bleeding whereas with regard to workability that also reduces. So in the case of bleeding potential we are able to see a positiveness in adding silica fume whereas when it comes to workability we find that it is getting drastically affected. Now coming on to air entrainment uh, in this figure what is shown is uh, the silica fume dosage is taken uh, in the x axis ranging from 0 to 20 percentage and the air entraining agent is taken uh, in the y axis uh, which is represented as percentage of control which means that assume that you need uh, X amount of uh, air entraining agent in order to achieve uh, air content of 6 plus or minus 1 percentage and uh, remember that this uh, quantity of air content is required to effectively resist uh, freeze thaw uh, actions in concrete. So if you want to use a control concrete and if you need X amount of air entraining agent in order to get a uh, air content of 6 plus or minus 1 percentage then that x amount is considered as 100 and uh, and likewise you have 200 and 300 indicating that there is 100 percentage increase above the control and uh, 200 percentage increase above the control. So, wha so what you find in the y axis is air entraining agent. Uh, specified in percentage of control and in the x axis you have silica fume dosage and what we find is that with increase in the silica fume dosage the air entraining agent required increases substantially. So to attain a 6 percentage or plus or minus 1 percentage air content the amount of air entraining agent that you have to put in the concrete to achieve 6 uh, plus or minus 1 percentage is actually higher for silica fume mixtures compared to uh, control mixture. So in other words in terms of cost you may have to spend more if you are using silica fume mixtures and hence you need additional air in the mixture to resist free thaw and hence you need more air entraining agent. 
Now coming to the next property which is setting time, both the initial and final setting time of Portland cement based space system decreases with the addition of silica fume particles and hence uh, it can be said that it has an accelerating effect when it comes to uh, setting time. But remember carefully that this accelerating effect is applicable only if you do not have a high range water reducer. For uh, mixtures which do not have a high range water reducing admixture, this is true for the silica fume mixture. But the moment you have a high range water reducing admixture, that can also affect the setting time. So, since high range water reducing admixtures are frequently required while using silica fume, the setting time may, uh, may increase or get altered in the presence of the former which is nothing but high range water reducing admixture. So, if you consider without a high range water reducing admixture, then the effect of silica fume is to reduce the setting time thereby creating a accelerating effect on the um, hydration of uh, cement. Now, the next property is heat of hydration and what is generally observed is that there is only slight variation in the heat of hydration of mixtures with the addition of silica fume particle and this has uh, primarily two reasons. One is that silica fume is used at a uh, usually at a lower dosage compared to fly ash or slag. So, typically what we have seen is that the recommended dosages is between 4 to 12 percent and um, at uh, such uh, dosages the amount of cement that is taken out of the system is relatively less compared to fly ash. So, uh, and hence the heat of hydration is not substantially increased or decreased. So, there is only slight variation in the heat of hydration and hence for applications where heat of hydration is a very important factor, then the uh, use of silica fume may not be a good option. But for applications where you need a higher early strength or others. Um, or you want an accelerating effect uh, with regard to setting time, then silica fume mixtures are preferred. When it comes to compressive strength, which is a very important property, especially when it comes to uh, Portland cement based space systems. Um, some information is provided. Here uh, typically you have four curves in the x axis we are taking uh, curing age and in the y axis uh, you have compressive strength expressed in uh, PSI, pounds per square inch. So, what you find is that you have four curves, one is uh, the 0 percentage or the reference curve, the other one is 10 percentage silica fume, the other one is 15 percentage and the, and the fourth one is uh, 20 percentage. So, what you find is that the more and more you start adding silica fume, uh, the strength is getting increased. But remember that there is always an optimal uh, percentage somewhere between 10 to 20 or 25 where the strength again decreases because uh, in this one um, silica fume is used as a replacement material for cement. So, the more and more you replace cement um, and you add silica fume um, uh, because of the reduction in the cement content the strength also decreases. So, whatever is shown here as an increasing trend that holds good only up to a certain uh, level of dosage. So, right now for this uh, type of silica fume that they have uh, investigated, um, what we find is that the strength keeps on increasing, but usually what happens is 10 to 20 percentage is the dosage at, at which you uh, tend to see that uh, you get a decrease in uh, compressive strength somewhere between 10 to 20 percentage. Now, uh, coming to uh, the rate of strength development graph, uh, if we have to compare it with uh, other admixtures uh, like uh, fly ash uh, uh, and in specific class C or class of fly ash, the figure is shown. Remember that this is a revisiting figure in the sense that we have already seen this in fly ash. The same figure is shown just to compare how a silica fume mixture performs compared to a fly ash mixture or control. So, what we have seen is that in the case of control mixture, there is a steep increase in compressive strength during the early stages, say up to for 28 days and after which uh, the increase in strength uh, flattens. In the case of silica fume mixtures, if you carefully observe comparing it with the control mixture, the strength increase is much much higher even at the early period say between 1 to uh, 7 days or 1 to 14 days and it is much higher in the sense it is much higher than even the control mixture. And, um, and uh, right, uh, right throughout uh, the curing period from say 0 uh, days to about 56 days, 
the strength of silica film mixture is much higher than control mixture. But remember that in this uh, figure, the percentage dosage is 15 percentage. So, if you take a lower dosage, uh, probably you will find uh, some curves which are uh, above the control curve. Uh, but uh, below the 15 percentage curve. And uh, if you also compare the silica film mixture with a uh, uh, class C or class F flyash, you can notice that silica film mixture generally give higher strength compared to flyash mixture. And uh, we also have two others uh, slag and rice cash which we will come at a later stage. Now next one is uh, permeability. Permeability of Portland cement based space system can can be decreased substantially and uh, when we say decrease substantially it is about one order magnitude. The reduced permeability is due to better particle packing in the bulk cement paste and better refinement at the ITZ through pozzolanic reaction. So to explain this we will go to a figure which actually shows the aggregate uh, uh, particle and also the cement paste which actually contains. Um, cement as well as silica fume particles. So, what you find is that there are two different zones, one is the transition zone, the other one is a bulk hydrated zone. Transition zone is actually the zone that is very close to the aggregates. So, this figure is a idealized figure compared to this aggregate, uh, compared to this figure in the sense that here uh, it is considered as a wall. The aggregate is considered as a wall and uh, two zones are identified. One is the zone that is very close to the aggregate called as a transition zone and the other one is the zone that is substantially away from the aggregate which is called as a bulk hydrated cement zone. So, in the figure what you find is that this transition zone basically is a zone around this particle and the bulk hydrated cement zone is actually the zone at the uh, away from the aggregate particles or towards the center of the main cement paste. So, what we find is that the reduced permeability is due to better packing in the bulk cement paste. So, if you take the cement paste zone which is the shaded region, um, there is very high uh, packing density primarily because of the white filling effect that we have uh, already seen. In addition to that you also see better refinement at the ITZ. So, even if you take this zone and compare uh, the, the zone that is around the aggregate particle and compare it with uh, uh, another mixture which do not contain silica fume, th this zone is much more refined for mixtures which contain silica fume. The next property is uh, pore size distribution and uh, what we find in this figure is that you have effective pore diameter in the x axis ranging from 0 micron meter to approximately 10 micron meter and accessible pore volume expressed in centimeters, uh, centimeter cube per gram. Remember that this effective pore diameter and accessible pore volume are uh, primarily from uh, mercury intrusion porosimetry curves. Okay? So, primarily you have to get back to those curves to understand uh, the explanation for what is pore volume and pore diameter and all others. So, here in this curve what we find is a control mixture where uh, the, uh, the pore diameters you, uh, typically varies from 0 0.001 uh, micron meter approximately to as high as 10 micron meter. And if you see the fly ash which we have already seen in the previous lectures, um, the pore size distributions are much lower as shown in the dotted uh, uh, dotted uh, line in the figure. And if you take a silica fume uh, replacement, we will uh, see that uh, these are much much uh, lower. So, in the, the third line that shows you find that the pore size distribution is much 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 lower. And uh, remember that the pore size distribution is also connected to porosity and uh, if the pore size distribution is smaller then the uh, then the porosity is smaller and hence the permeability is also very uh, low. So, if you get back to the permeability property that we just discussed now. The permeability uh, decreases substantially one order magnitude compared to that of the control mixture. So, compared to the control mixture you find that the pore sizes are much much smaller that uh, it is very difficult for any water or external agents to actually permeate through silica fume based mixtures. 
when it comes to sulfate resistance again remember that this uh, figure is already discussed with regard to fly ash replacement now we are covering silica film replacement so compared to control mixture the silica film mixture substantially reduces the expansion due to sulfate so as uh, you can recall that this point 1 is a limited uh, expansion specified in code at a, a period of 6 months okay and for silica film mixture it is substantially lower and even with uh, more time the silica film mixture uh, ex the expansions with silica film mix uh, mixture does not uh, go above 0.1 percentage but the same thing is not true uh, for uh, fly ash uh, mixtures at a later uh, ages the fly ash mixtures can also uh, show higher expansions much higher than the limited expansion that is provided in standard coach. But uh, remember that here the replacement level of fly ash and silica fume are not specified. So, what we have to understand is that these are replacements which are the within the recommended replacement levels. So, if you take fly ash um, the replacement that is specified could anywhere range between say 15 percentage to 35 percentage because that is what is the specified replacement level for fly ash. In the case of silica fume uh, whatever is specified here is between 4 percentage to um, 12 percentage. So, within the recommended level silica fume uh, mixtures perform much better than fly ash mixtures. Applications of silica fume, uh, silica fume is primarily used uh, to reduce alkali silica reaction. Uh, it is a very effective pozolone and, uh, uh, and uh, the alkali silica reaction problems are largely encountered by using uh, silica fume at a very low dosages. Even fly ash is capable of reducing uh, expansions, but not to the level silica fume uh, reduces. Um, the next application is to produce highly impermeable, uh, impermeable concretes particularly for seashore structures. So, if we want to uh, use uh, uh, where we have different actions from um, solutions and others and uh, silica fume can uh, be a good choice. But remember that the choice of uh, a particular material depends also on the economy. So, since silica fume is not an economical material, other uh, pozzolanic materials which are cheaper are preferred. In that case, even fly ash and uh, slag uh, are used for such uh, low permeable applications. Uh, the third one is uh, to increase early age strength of Portland cement concrete or concrete containing fly ash or slag. So, in fly ash what we have seen is one of the problems or limitations that we found with fly ash is that at uh, higher dosages or under uh, cold environments you do not get uh, the early strength or at least the minimum strength that is required for uh, the particular demolding purpose or uh, others. So, in such cases in the mixture we can add a little bit of silica fume somewhere between 4 to 8 percentage. So, that uh, the silica fume in the mixture provides the early strength properties and the latter age strength properties are provided by the pozzolanic reaction from the fly ash. In such cases where silica fume is also used along with fly ash or slag those mixtures are referred as ternary blend mixtures. Uh, the other application is as already mentioned uh, silica fume can be used at a much higher dosage uh, uh, in ultra high performance concretes for bridges and uh, sometimes uh, if it is specified uh, that the quantity of cement is substantial and uh, it creates higher reactivity in the uh, in the in that particular application uh, silica fume can also be used to conserve cement or to reduce the uh, use of cement. Uh, the final one is uh, silica fume can also be used for fiber reinforced shortcrete applications uh, primarily in tunnels. In addition to uh, all these applications we should also remember that uh, we also have limitations of using silica fume. One is the availability, the silica fume is 
considered as a waste uh, product and it is not actively marketed for use. This is primarily for uh, two reasons. One is that uh, the dosage is very much restricted and silica fume is a very costly material. The other one is that silica fume also has applications in other industries not just in construction industry whereas fly ash does not have uh, application in uh, other industries. So, that is one uh, reason um, why uh, silica fume is also a very costly material compared to others. Silica fume has very good application in other industries. Handling problem because of its extreme uh, fineness silica fume is difficult to handle. Uh, people who work with silica fume have to be little more careful because it is a finer material and it can sort of uh, create uh, some smoke or something while uh, making uh, mixtures and it can also eventually lead to health hazards uh, and the constant exposure to silica fume uh, may result in health problems like silicosis, uh, skin problems and other respiratory problems. So, uh, some care should be taken while uh, using silica fume in uh, concrete. Uh, in addition to that uh, the biggest limitation is uh, very high uh, cost um, and usually we can assume that it varies from um, anywhere between half to uh, two times the price of normal Portland cement and this uh, half to two times is actually in India. In United States it is typically two to three times costlier than normal Portland cement. And also we find that uh, you have huge disadvantages when it comes to entraining air in the sense that you need higher amounts of air entraining dosage and that also adds to the high cost of uh, the uh, entire mixture. So, with this uh, we are completing uh, silica fume and uh, now our uh, next topic will be slag. So, the next topic is uh, blast furnace slag. The word blast furnace primarily because slag is a byproduct, industrial byproduct uh, in the manufacture of uh, uh, steel, uh, in the manufacture of iron or steel, and uh, usually blast furnace is actually used to in the manufacture of iron ores or copper ores. So, so, the term blast furnace basically comes along with slag uh, because of the process that is used. Now, what is the definition of slag? The most, uh, the more appropriate definition of slag is provided here. The non-metallic product consisting essentially of calcium silicates and other bases developed in a molten condition simultaneously with pig iron in a blast furnace is called as slag and it is a byproduct obtained from the blast furnaces used to make iron and uh, many times uh, nowadays even during uh, the extraction of copper blast furnaces are used and even in uh, that process we also get uh, slag in that case it is called as copper slag ok. So, in all other cases generally uh, slag is called as a blast furnace slag. So, the principal elements, uh, the principal raw materials used are iron or copper in the case of slag. Now, the production process uh, as uh, already mentioned uh, for silica fume, the production process is not very important for this course, but at least you should know uh, what are the basic uh, raw materials that are used, what is the temperature levels and uh, some other minor information about the production process. So, what you have is that you have a blast furnace in this uh, figure and uh, you have uh, the basic raw materials such as coke, iron ore and limestone. Remember that coke and limestone are basically um, uh, the uh, basically other materials that are present in the ores and uh, they are basically heated to a temperature of 1500 degrees Celsius and uh, basically uh, at that temperature um, the mixture melts and um, in at one end you get uh, slag and at the other end you have the molten iron which is used for uh, the, the iron making process. So, uh, the uh, slag is basically obtained as a byproduct and above whatever uh, gases that come out of the heating process that escapes out to the atmosphere. So, blast furnaces are fed with controlled mixture of iron ore, coke and limestone. Remember that the raw materials are used in some uh, appropriate proportion. 
and uh, the operational temperature is approximately 1500 degrees Celsius. Two products are obtained from furnace. One is a molten iron which is actually used uh, by the iron companies for making steel or other uh, products and the other one is a molten slag which is later on cooled down and um, the cooling is again a, a stage by stage process. The molten slag is then cooled using various methods uh, to produce different forms of slag. And this is again another uh, uh, schematic uh, figure to represent the slag production where you can find uh, uh, coke or limestone or dolomite which are actually the raw materials for iron. And, uh, and again you may have some iron source uh, which are added as a scrap material into the furnace and you get uh, the iron, the pure iron and you also get slag. And again this slag can be either disposed or this can be processed and reused. And again um, uh, in this iron you have uh, the uh, basic oxygen furnace through which steel is produced. So this again a schematic uh, representation just to show what happens in the production of slag. Now the molten slag comprises approximately 20 percentage by mass of iron. The slag primarily consists of silicates and aluminosilicates of lime and magnesia. This is a very important point. Uh, slag primarily contains silicates and aluminosilicates of lime and magnesia. Remember that lime is uh, uh, lime and magnesia usually creates expansion and hence uh, and uh, we have seen these things in uh, cement and fly ash. So the same thing also holds good here. So whenever we use uh, slag there are also limits for lime and magnesia specified in the codes. Slag from different plants differ in chemical, mineral and physical constituents and hence it is important to study the physical and chemical properties. Now the different forms of slags that are available are as follows. One is air cooled blast furnace slag, the second one is expanded or foamed slag third one is pelletized slag and the uh, fourth one is granulated blast furnace slag. Okay, so this is the granulated blast furnace slag is actually uh, more popular and uh, many times it is just called as slag. And uh, you get uh, these four forms of slag because of the different methods that are used in the, uh, in the cooling stage of slag. And we will uh, in this lecture largely see the uh, gra uh, ground, uh, granulated blast uh, furnace slag or simply called as slag. Now the chemical properties of slag are as follows. One it is important to know the oxide composition. The other one it is important to know mineral, uh, mineral composition or mineralogical composition. The third one it is important to know the chemical requirements mentioned in the codes. So what we will do right now is that we will go through this but remember that the mineral or mineralogical composition uh, is not yet fully understood uh, by researcher even today. So there is a good scope for research in that area. So mineralogical composition for this uh, course is not really important although it is specified what types of uh, minerals are present in it. Now the first one is oxide composition of slag. What is shown here are the oxides starting from uh, calcium oxide to uh, sulfur trioxide um, and uh, he here you have two columns. One is for Portland cement, the other one is for blast furnace slag. So if you carefully look, the blast furnace slag has a substantial amount of calcium oxide but the amount of calcium oxide present is much lower than what you find in Portland cement. But remember that the calcium oxide present in slag is much much higher than uh, the calcium oxide present in uh, fly ash or silica fume. Uh, in fact for silica fume uh, typically the calcium oxide uh, is uh, zero or very uh, little whereas in the case of fly ash you still have some substantial amount of calcium oxide when it comes to even the class C fly ash. Compared to even the class C fly ash the blast furnace slag has higher amounts of calcium oxide. And when it comes to alumina, uh, silica and iron, the ranges are provided here 8 to 16 percentage, 33 to 42 percent and 2 to 3 percent. And uh, what is more important, uh, second most important after calcium oxide is silica. So the silica is typically 33 to 40 percentage which is much higher than what you have in Portland cement. 
The comparative uh, oxide compositions of slag with other materials is also required and uh, that is also important from the standpoint of assignments, uh, quizzes or, uh, uh, or exam. Now, when it comes to mineralogical composition, what is identified is that there are several compounds that are formed in uh, that are available in slag. So, um, about uh, uh, 11 compounds are definitely identified as uh, mineralogical compounds in slag and some chemical formulas are provided here. Remember that uh, as I mentioned uh, previously, uh, the mineralogical composition is still under research uh, and hence uh, we do not have to uh, discuss about this slide uh, very much in detail. But you can understand that there are very many compounds that actually makes it very difficult to uh, understand the slag. Now, uh, coming to the physical properties, uh, the important physical properties that are discussed are morphology and particle shape, uh, specific gravity and particle size and fineness and color. Okay, so, uh, morphology and particle shape, uh, slag particles have angular uh, shape and uh, they are characterized by sharp edges and angles. So, this is pretty much similar to that of uh, cement in the sense that the particle size are angular in shape and this is typically uh, what you see with uh, slag particles. So, the particles will be um, completely angular in shape. The effect of particle shape on workability is minimum. Uh, minimal. Uh, in the case of uh, cement, what we have seen is um, the angular particle actually is a problem for workability. In the case of fly ash, what we have seen is the particles are spherical in shape that helps in uh, providing workability. In the case of silica fume, what we have seen is the particles are spherical in shape, but the fineness of the silica fume is much more a dominating fa factor with regard to workability. In the case of uh, slag, the particles are angular in shape, but uh, it does not, uh, it is not a big factor when it comes to workability. There are much other factors like particle size or fineness which are uh, important factors for workability. So, shape is not really considered as an important factor uh, with regard to workability. Now, uh, coming to the next uh, property which is particle size and fineness, the fineness of uh, slag is approximately 495 centimeter square per gram and this is expressed in terms of blind surface area. So, the surface area mentioned here is uh, uh, determined based on blind's fineness and uh, the same procedure that is followed for uh, the fineness of cement particle, fly ash and others can be used for um, determining the fineness of slag particles also. Fineness and particle size distribution of slag affects the strength properties of concrete and depends upon uh, whether the slag is unground or ground. Um, what you have to understand is that the material granulated uh, blast furnace slag that we directly get from the plant is actually in the unground form. So, um, the question comes whether you want to grind it for finer or coarser or you, wa you want to have it uh, without grinding. If you have it without grinding, then the properties of slag is not fully used for the application. So, in most of the cases, the slag is actually ground to a very fine, uh, uh, very uh, fine uh, size and then it is used for applications. So, uh, the next property is color. Uh, in the case of slag, slag is white in color and, and, uh, and a comparative uh, color of uh, cement, slag, silica fume and fly ash is provided. Again, uh, what you have to understand with respect to silica fume is that silica, silica fume can also be, be white in color, although it is usually dark gray or gray in color primarily because of the presence of uh, carbon or iron. But remember that silica fume can also be white in color. And likewise, fly ash shown here is actually um, uh, largely yellow in color, but remember that fly ash can also be gray or dark gray in color depending upon the quantity of silicon dioxide and calcium oxide present in fly ash. In the case of slag, largely slag is white in color. Now, when it comes to usage in Portland cement based space systems, slag is used. Uh, 
as a partial can be used as a partial replacement material or it can be used as a additional constituent material to cement in the case of partial replacement material the uh, typical dosages that can be generally used are between 25 percentage to as high as 70 percentage however the code uh, the code provided uh, recommended dosage levels is between 25 percentage to 40 percentage by mass of cement and at the research level people have also gone up to 70 percentage by mass of cement the two strategies that are used while using uh, slag are as follows slag can be either added directly in the cement manufacturing unit or it can be used at the concrete uh, making site directly as a admixture in uh, concrete in the cement manufacturing plant again there are uh, two uh, things that are followed one is the slag can be added to clinker and gypsum and ground separately uh, which means slag is separately ground clinker is separately ground and gypsum is uh, separately ground and all these things can be uh, blended well and then uh, used in uh, doing that process many times the slag may be ground or may not be ground depending upon the consistency that you obtain for the clinker and gypsum so so that is about separate grinding in the sense that the material, the ingredients can be separately ground and then blended well in the case of second one which is called as inter grinding slag clinker and gypsum are mixed together in desired proportion and then ground all together so um, many times what happens is in some cases the separate grinding is preferred because the energy required to uh, grind separately may be lower in, uh, in some other cases uh, grinding all materials together uh, requires uh, higher energy so depending upon uh, lower energy one of these is preferred in the manufacturing plant and uh, the other way is that slag can be uh, slag of desired fineness can be added to concrete directly during the mixing process so these are the two strategies while using slag in portland cement based base systems now is there any factors that affect the reactivity of slag um, yes we have several factors and uh, largely uh, some factors are physical properties and some factors are chemical properties um, fineness or particle uh, surface area is a very important factor um, that provides the reactivity to slag and also the particle size distribution has immense effect on the reactivity of slag in the case of chemical uh, factors we have the glass content or mineralogy uh, re remember that again the mineralogical uh, constitu constituents of slag is not discussed elaborately in this uh, uh, lecture primarily because uh, that subject is actually under uh, research so uh, but we have to understand that the glass content in the minerals can actually um, affect uh, substantially the reactivity of slag in addition to the physical and chemical properties you you can also see that the temperature that is used in the production process can actually affect the reactivity of slag now when it comes to uh, uh, characterizing slag as a pozzolanic material in portland cement based base systems uh, two properties come into picture one is uh, water requirement the other one is slag or uh, uh, strength activity index if you again recall some of the characterization test methods that were uh, performed for fly ash to serve as a pozzolanic admixture in uh, cement based space systems what we found is that we had uh, these type of tests like water requirement strength activity index or other uh, test autoclave test or others that came into picture so i am not getting into the details of water requirement and others because the, that is already uh, uh, explained now we come to the strength activity index uh, here in this lecture it is denoted as sai and it is expressed as sai equal to sp divided by p into 100 and sp is nothing but uh, the strength of the mortar cube that is prepared using slag and it is average or uh, average compressive strength uh, divided by the average compressive strength of the reference mixture which does not contain slag so if you find this as a percentage that is what is called as slag activity index or strength activity index 
this factor is important and this is many times used to classify slag into different categories. So, now coming to the classification of slag, um, we do not have a proper IS classification for slag, but we do have some ASTM standards. We, um, uh, ASTM C989 provides uh, the classification for slag based on slag activity index. And uh, based on that you have three different grades, grade 80, grade 100 and grade 120 and all these things are based on the strength activity index. So, to understand what is grade uh, 80, grade 100 and grade 20, uh, a table is provided and what you find is that uh, in this table here you find the three grades and you find the relative strength compared to that of the control. So, if you consider the control strength to be 100, um, these are uh, the values that uh, these are the limits that are specified for 7 days and 28 days. Right now forgetting the 7 days, let us go to the 28 days because primarily the 28 days uh, provides the design strength. So, um, what you find is that you have the average values that are provided and also you have the individual values. So, for a grade 80, what is important is that the average 28 days compressive strength that you find should be at least a 75 percentage that of the control mixture. So, this is uh, expressed as relative strength with respect to control mixture or reference uh, mortar. So, um, so, whatever slag that you are using, if it gives 75 percentage average compressive strength at 28 days uh, and remember that 75 and 80 are very close. Okay. So, then that uh, slag is classified as grade 80 slag. Likewise, uh, if uh, the relative strength is approximately 95 percentage which is slightly below 100 percentage, then that slag is classified as uh, grade 100 slag. Likewise, 115, uh, if the slag uh, that you use has given 115 percentage of the strength that you get from a control motor, then it is termed as grade 120. So, these things are uh, very important and uh, the information from the 7 days for this course is not required and hence you can eliminate this. So, when you study uh, this classification, study only from the standpoint of 28 days. Coming on to the next important topic which is effects of slag on specific properties of Portland cement based base system. As you already know that we have already covered fly ash and silica fume and how it affects different properties. Now, here we will quickly go into the individual properties because we most of the slides shown are the repetitive slides for uh, from fly ash or silica fume mixtures. Now, with regard to water demand, at recommended dosage levels, the addition of slag improves workability and lowers water demand. Uh, and this is primarily due to two effects. One is that um, what is the dosage of slag that you use. So, uh, like already mentioned in the previous point, at the recommended dosage which is between 25 to 40 percent, typically the uh, workability increases. But remember that the moment you actually increase the dosage beyond 40 percentage, then uh, then the workability will be lower. So, you have to be very careful with the dosage of slag that is used. The second important thing is fineness of slag. So, if you use uh, slag of very high fineness, then that will uh, that can also uh, reduce the workability and increase the water demand opposite to of what we uh, saw at the recommended dosage. So, the point here is that even at recommended dosage levels, you can also see that slag can actually reduce workability and increase the water demand. Uh, but if it does that, then we can uh, be little sure that the particle size of slag is very, very uh, uh, small or in other words, the fineness is very high. The second important point is bleeding and we find that the bleeding is reduced because of the addition of slag and primarily the uh, reason is due to the uh, higher fineness of slag particles. The same effect we have also seen with silica fume. So, the same thing holds good for slag also. Now, coming to the setting time at recommended dosage levels, the setting time of Portland cement based space system is increased because of the addition of slag and with increase in uh, slag dosage beyond the recommended dosage, the setting time of the system increases. So, 
For example, an increase in the slag content from 35 percentage to as high as 65 percentage can actually increase the setting time by uh, 60 minutes. Okay, that's a very important uh, point. Uh, when we go to uh, setting time becomes a very important uh, factor when it comes to large volume of concrete. So, um, so if you uh, take uh, uh, an example of a dam or other structure where huge amount of concrete is used, um, this point uh, is uh, very much valid. The delay in setting time can be beneficial particularly in large pores and in hot weather conditions in which this property uh, prevents the formation of cold joints in successive pores. So, uh, even though we have a negative, um, negative thing with respect to slag addition, uh, in cases where you have large pores, remember that when you have large pores, huge amount of cement is uh, present and when you replace huge amount of cement with slag, the heat of hydration completely reduces. So, uh, in places where the strength is less important, the early age strength is less important and, uh, and uh, the heat of hydration is a very important factor, then slag is a uh, very preferred pozzolan compared to others. Uh, and likewise, even in hot uh, weather conditions where we want uh, setting time uh, to uh, be a little longer, slag is actually preferred primarily from the standpoint of cold joints and others. The next property is air entrainment. At recommended dosage levels, the air entrainment of Portland cement based space system decreases with the addition of slag and uh, this is similar to that of silica fume. And, uh, more air entraining, uh, air entraining admixtures are required um, to achieve the specific air content that is required and this again depends on the fineness of slag. So, fineness of slag has a substantial effect on many properties of Portland cement based space systems containing slag. Now, um, if slag is finer than cement, greater amounts of much much higher amounts of air entraining admixtures are required. Now, the next important property is compressive strength. What we can find is that with the addition of slag, the early age compressive strength drastically decreases. This is one drawback uh, of, uh, of slag with respect to application is uh, with respect to application. However, slag provides a higher later age strength which again can be converted into a advantage. So, for applications where early age strength is required, slag is usually not preferred and silica fume is preferred um, and for uh, applications which require a, a later age uh, uh, compressive strength, slag is largely preferred. The compressive strength of slag concrete approaches that of control concrete somewhere between 7 days to 28 days and beyond 28 days we what we usually find is that the slag the strength of slag concrete are much much higher than the control concrete. So, the graph that we seen for the fly ash and uh, silica fume the same uh, figure is shown. Uh, so, where you find uh, that the slag mixtures initially do not uh, give uh, much strength. So, when you compare it with the control mixture, they are much lower. However, with the time, the slag mixtures uh, gains uh, strength and you can find that say above uh, say uh, 42 or 56 days, the, the strength of slag mixtures are much much higher than even silica fume mixture or fly ash mixtures. So, uh, slag has a very different uh, property and uh, because of that uh, the applications for the usage of slag also varies. The uh, dosage that is provided for rice's cash is currently not required and hence uh, it can be omitted for this uh, uh, lecture. Likewise, you see uh, the, uh, the already seen uh, heat of hydration graph where you can see that the use of slag substantially, lo uh, substantially lowers the uh, heat of hydration in the Portland cement based space system expressed in terms of concrete temperature. Um, so, compared to Portland uh, cement system, uh, the system containing slag provides much lower concrete temperatures. Likewise, the same we can observe with pore size distribution also. In terms of pore size distribution, uh, slag uh, based mixtures uh, have uh, much more smaller pores and the pore volumes are also much lower. Likewise, if you take the sulphate resistance, slag cements are much more capable 
of uh, providing uh, much lower expansions compared to even silica film fly ash or control mixtures. But uh, remember one thing very carefully that here the dosage is not the dosage is not mentioned and whatever dosage that we are seeing is only recommended dosage. So, it is not at a fixed dosage levels. So, um, that means here fly ash is used at a typical dose recommended dosage level of um, 15 percentage to 35 percentage. Here silica fume is used at a typical dosage level of 4 percentage to 12 percentage and slag is used at a typical dosage level of 25 percentage to 40 percentage. If you do test where if you fix the uh, dosage level of uh, pozzolans in each of these, in that case the behavior could be different. Some other mixtures could give uh, better performance compared to the slag mixtures. Okay. So, these uh, replacement levels are at recommended replacement levels. Now, uh, summarizing some of the advantages of uh, slag, um, slag decreases the water demand. Uh, less heat is generated during hydration. Uh, it also produces a more whitish cement. Uh, in addition to that, it also has increased long term strength, uh, decreased permeability, increased pore refinement which means uh, smaller pore size, uh, increased sulphate resistance and increased alkali silica reaction resistance. So, this is about advantages that does not mean that you do not have disadvantages. You also have disadvantages such as cra cracking problems especially um, uh, because of uh, the lower uh, because of higher setting time and uh, reduced rate of strength gain and others. Um, in addition to that uh, in the case of cold weather concreting the strength attained by uh, slag uh, based mixtures are very low and again when it comes to freezing and thawing environments the strength of the mixtures are very poor and again when it comes to situations where we have to remove the form work as early as possible even in such uh, situations slag concretes have disadvantages. And uh, in summary what we have seen in uh, these lectures from uh, 28 to 30 is that we have seen the production uh, production process of silica fume, we have seen the physical and chemical properties of silica fume, we have seen uh, some of the important effects of silica silica fume on Portland on properties of Portland cement based space systems and uh, similar things we have also seen for slag. At the bottom line what you have to understand is that even though min uh, mineral admixtures generally includes very many things like uh, slag, fly ash, silica fume and many times all these uh, pozzolans are commonly uh, called as mineral admixtures and, uh, and or supplementary cementing materials. The property, the physical and chemical properties of each of these materials can immensely affect each of the properties of concrete when it is used as a mineral admixture in Portland cement based space systems. And understanding the physical and chemical properties of each of these will actually help in understanding what properties it can, uh, what improved properties you can obtain with Portland cement based space systems. So, with this uh, the set of lectures from uh, L uh, set of lectures from 21 to 30 is coming to an end. Thank you.